Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday, and joining us is... Hi, it's me again. Oh, oh she didn't have a name apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't remember me anyways. It's yeah. Autumn Rain's Heart. Yeah, and so what are you wearing tonight, Donna? I'm wearing a jacket that says I really do care because I'm gonna go out and fucking vote in November. Um, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, um, so this week I decided to take Donatella's trash bag outfit and then put it on myself and then it ripped, so I made a new one. Oh. I am currently wearing heels on my feet, on my hands, and on my head, and nothing else. Like, it's alarming. Like, do you know the song, like, do your things hang low? Because they might wobble to and fro. <laughs> How avant-garde. I know, right? I'm just like Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> Don't touch me. I'm an artist. <laughs> All right. So we were going to go on to our true crime this week, but we decided in the spirit of National Coming Out Day, we're going to do one more coming out story. So this is going to officially be Coming Out Part 4. And five. F- five. Yes. It is five. five. Gosh, I forgot. It's Donna, coming Out Part 5. When is National Coming Out Day? National Coming Out Day is October 11th every year and actually started in the year 1988. So it's 32 years old. It started um, during a gay liberation movement because it was right around the time of um, the AIDS crisis. And it was actually at a gay rights march on Washington that National Coming Out Day came out because coming out is the most basic form of activism when you come out to your friends, family, and coworkers. And rebellion. True. Yeah. And, and the thing is, like, even with coming out day, um, as we always preface with all of these, do not come out until you're ready. And mm-hmm. here's the thing. National coming out day can be incredibly triggering. And since mm-hmm. I live in Portland now, I use that term way too frequently. Um, it is. Like, so you'll see on Facebook, and you're one of those little gaybies struggling to come out of the closet, and then all yeah. of your friends are doing it. And it's going to feel like the right time. But if it doesn't feel like the right time to you yeah then don't do it. don't do it don't do it but Remember, peer pressure is bad i find that national coming out day is always a good time to reflect on our stories and as we've been doing this over the past month we've talked about the highs the lows the goods the bads and we've talked specifically about queens coming out in this episode we're gonna take a little bit of a different route yeah so my husband is joining us today um he is cisgender and he's not a drag queen, but he's a drag queen DJ. He is. He is. Adam, how does it feel to be on this end of the podcast instead of waiting in the room for us to finish up? <laughs> it's a little intimidating. <laughs> drag queens use intimidate. It was super effective. <laughs> that was good. That's good. <laughs> so Adam is uh, Coco's husband's name, um, also known as DJ Queer Cub DJ on Instagram. Queer Cub! Find him, follow him, know it. Please follow him, like on the street, not Instagram. Or, like, uh, Instagram uh, like, yeah. Follow him. Let him know you love him. Scare him. Into stores and then buy his thing. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Don't let Coco see you because she'll fight. That's also tea. Well, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, now we learned about National Coming Out Day, so we have one more story for you guys. So, Adam, take us through your coming out story. I would say my coming out story has three parts. The first one... The first part of my story is more along the lines of when my mom found out. Mm -hmm. Uh, So to keep it brief, uh, when I was a young teenager, I had intimate relations with another boy. His parents found out, called my mom while I was at school, and then she accosted me after school on the ride home. Define accosted. Uh, Well, I got in the car and she was like, so are you gay? Oh. And uh, I was, I, you know, I paused for a moment. How old were you? Uh, at this conversation, 17. Okay. Okay. So 17 years old. Um, and I, you know, I paused for a moment and I was like, yeah, I'm gay. But I had known since I was probably 12. Uh, and so... I felt fairly confident, but it was the first time I had ever said it out loud to my mom. Mm-hmm. And she paused for a moment after I had told her, after I had confirmed. And she said, you know, I think I always knew and I'll always love you. 
So that definitely, yeah, that definitely put it into me that I had someone in my corner yeah. to a degree. Yeah. Um, so you and Autumn share the fact that you both had a car coming out that was fairly positive. <laughs> <laughs> Forced upon us. Where were you living at the time? Oh. Uh, can we cuss? Yeah. Absolutely. Please do. Yeah. Shithole, malfunction, junction, Colorado. Oh, in Grand Junction, Colorado. It was terrible. Uh, luckily for me, my mom was fairly forward thinking, fairly mm-hmm. open minded. She's a um, hippie. Yeah, uh, ex GI turned hippie, but yes. Uh, yes. Um, and actually, that's the second part to my story is uh, my mom was in the military. And shortly after I came out, we had to move to Massachusetts. And uh, I was in school there, and I decided that I wanted to try and live my out life, Mm -hmm. which meant painting my nails, um, dressing a little bit more feminine, not feminine clothes per se, but just not the typical cishet thing. Yeah. And uh, she was not against it. She never really said anything. But I always got like a side eye every time I went a little bit too far, maybe, mm-hmm. in her opinion. And she did say to me one time, uh, she's like, you know, I, I'm absolutely fine with you being gay just as long as you're not flaming. Yikes. Yikes. Yeah. And I think that hit home a little bit harder than I intended it to. Mm-hmm. So I have, I've just, within the last probably year, uh, come into more of my, not me. <laughs> <Flaming>. <laughs> uh, like preference for more femininity yeah. um, over the cis het gender normality if you will what is perceived yeah. um, so I uh, so the second part is that when I was being more feminine as a teenager um, and I was going to school and coming out to my classmates my peers who I hadn't even known for that long. Mm -hmm. And it was nice that they knew what I had considered to be the real me at that time. But of course, as you learn and live, your experiences change, your, the way that you perceive yourself even changes sometimes. And so that wasn't really the real me. I was just, I think I was trying to find something to latch onto. And I probably went a little bit too far, even in my own book. Um, but it was an experience that I'm glad that I had in order to kind of figure out who I am. Yeah. I think it's interesting too that with like people who are heterosexual, they want gay people to be palatable at yeah. first. It's like they want us to be a Pete Buddha judge gay, not a RuPaul or not a, you know, someone who expresses our, themselves really colorful yeah. because it's like the more that you can blend in, the more you can assimilate, the less hard of a time you're going to have. Definitely. Yeah. So I realized that, you know, in finding yourself, there's always going to be a little bit of a learning curve. And uh, to backtrack just a tiny bit, um, when I was seven years old, I convinced my mom to buy me a pair of white leather platform go-go boots from a thrift store. Wow. And uh, she bought them for me. And I pranced around (laughs) in a teal bed sheet for a week with those. Until I outgrew them and got really sad. Uh, so the fact that she didn't see it sooner, or maybe she did, I don't know. But uh, that was pretty telling for me. So when did you know yourself? You said 12. I think, right? yeah. yeah. But yeah. Like, take us through that part of the story. So when I figured out for myself that I was queer, and I say queer as opposed to gay because I've never really... There's a, there's a lot of unanswered questions even for myself, but I definitely prefer men. And yeah. I realized that in middle school, in the locker room, like I'm sure many have. Um, Same. I was always yeah. very self-conscious. I didn't want to change in front of everyone else. Mm-hmm. But I didn't mind being there where all everyone else changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did like the um, hyper-masculine like, kind of energy of the locker room kind of intimidate you a little bit? A right, lot. So, yeah. A lot. Too. A because, lot of it, yeah. Because there was always, you know, the towel whips on each other yeah. and the, like, subtle jibing but not actually, like, flirting because that was completely, you know... Yeah, because if you took it too far, exactly. then you would get bullied for it. Yeah. Yeah. Which I definitely did. Um, I was bullied for being gay and adamantly was against it, um, even though I had... Even though I had 
told myself that I was when I was 12. Uh-huh. Um, and, and just going forward, it was always trying to navigate the difference in your peers versus your parents versus the outside world, how the outside world sees you. Yeah. I definitely live as a very cis masculine person in general, but I have a lot of feminine qualities in myself mm-hmm. that I've appreciated. Yeah. When did your mom finally get on board? I don't know. Um, I think it, it. I think it took a while for her to, her to get on board, mm-hmm. um, and I think it also makes a difference as to whether or not you consider that like a light switch or just like a gradual coming into acceptance mm-hmm. kind of a thing. I think she was. I think she's become more accepting in the last couple of years, especially since we've been together. Um, I, I was never actually very stable mentally when I was younger. I had a lot of uh, twists and turns, and I saw a therapist for a couple of years, and I think finding stability in my adult life and having a long-term relationship has definitely helped her feel that I am better in myself, and I think that's helped her with her acceptance. Mm-hmm. So, did she have any gay friends? Was she? Uh, did she ever have anyone that she kind of associated with that was LGBT that she could, I mean, at least feel more comfortable about you coming out? Not with? when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. But when I was 14 or 15, mm-hmm. my dad actually came out to me as bi. Oh, wow. Um, and that that was an awkward moment for me. Because uh-huh. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to say to that. Yeah. Because I was never really close with my dad. My, my parents had separated when I was younger. And so the fact that I hadn't come out to my mom yet, mm-hmm. I was more concerned to coming out to my dad, even though he had come out to me. And I'm, I'm not sure where the disconnect in my mind was. Maybe it's that I was scared that he would judge me more harshly. But looking back now, I actually wish that I had came out to him when I was younger when he yeah. came out to me as bisexual and I think we would have bonded more strongly over that yeah um that's a really unique perspective too it is not many people can say that they have that interaction with their parent it with yeah with my father coming out as bisexual before I ever told him that I was gay yeah I so I came out as gay to my mom when I was 17 I came out to my dad as gay when I was 19 mm-hmm. so it was probably four or five years after he had come out to me as bisexual. Hmm. Um, and those years were reasonably tense, uh, just because we weren't interacting on a regular basis. Well, actually, let me pause you there. Donna, I forgot to ask you, how are you doing this evening? I'll let you know after this brief commercial break, Coco. Hey, all you beauties, this is Manhattan Brown. Eugene's bearded lady with a special message. Do you love podcasting queers, queer issues and themes? Well, check out Queer with Attitude on your podcast app for a new obsession that focuses on tearing down the societal norms in the LGBTQIA plus community with weekly guests, creative writing, and a special cocktail of the week designed by mixologist Brian Peterson. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and other podcasting apps, or you can check us out at anchor.fm backslash queer with attitude to see where to find us and to become a monthly sponsor. Join the queer revolution to educate, create, and inspire. It's a podcast Check it out. with Coco and Donna Telepodcast. Check it out. Tune into what they tell you podcast Check it out. with Coco and Donna Tell a podcast. Check it out. I am feeling nice, calm, and sober because we're celebrating Sober October. Sober October. I am drunk. Autumn is drunk. Autumn is drunk. <laughs> Nothing is new. I watched the debates and it stressed me out. <laughs> oh, yes. At the time of filming this, we did all watch the debates together. The debates yes. used vice grip, and I needed a vice. When was you being stressed ever an excuse to drink, though? No, no. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I could drink because it's Tuesday, and Tuesday is stressful. 
Truth. But also, this gives us a great segue into what Donna said at the beginning of the episode, which is vote, 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 vote wait, make, but Coco, vote. did you vote? I voted. Donna, you voted. Coco, have you voted? My um, mail-in ballot hasn't came in yet. Ballot We're lying to the people. <laughs> I absolutely voted. I voted, sure. <laughs> I, I sure as hell will vote, though. Oh, my God, God I can't it. wait to vote. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle in those bubbles like a scantron has never existed. Honestly, like it's gonna be so good. I know Trump, twenty twenty. <laughs> what? I'll fucking kill you. Yeah. Um, Coco's voted out of the island. I was, um. I was hanging out with a friend yesterday, and we like passed by like a Trump sign. I was like, fucking gross. And he's like, well, what if this is the time that I tell you that like I'm a Trump supporter? I was like, well, we're on the interstate, and I'm about to drop you off in the center lane. And just so you know, <laughs> hitchhiking on the interstate and or walking is illegal. Good luck getting back to my house where your car is. Right? Okay, but seriously, in all seriousness, the stakes are, have not ever been higher. For any, and I've, I've speaking, spoken to people much older than me, the stakes have not been higher in any election, ever. even in their lifetime. So really, go out there, vote. We have a president right now that is going to try and concede the results of this election. We need to make sure that we, who are in full support of getting this clown out of office, I mean... That may not be your view if you're listening to this, but it is mine, and why are you listening it if it's not? <laughs> exactly. If you don't support us, faggots, you don't support us at all. Go Truth. away. Truth. And so one thing I want to say to everybody out there is, like, the biggest thing in my lifetime that has happened probably thus far is marriage equality. Yes. Because in all of our lifetimes, and everyone listening to this, like, we never thought that we would make it here, even within mm-hmm. our own lifetimes for everybody I'm recording this with today. And I don't want my marriage or anyone else's marriage to be under attack. So it's really important to have a president who sees value in human love. So And, yeah, and the far right, they're running on a platform against marriage equality. They are wanting to reverse the decision that has been put in. Um, it's something that, uh, if you do your research, uh, there are a lot of people in the religious right that... Um, still feel attacked by the fact that marriage equality did pass, and that is a scary future to think of. So um, vote to protect your rights and the rights of the people that you love. Yep, that's the best way to put it. So, segueing back into Adam's story... um, Speaking of people we love... Yes, there you go, that's a good one. Um, (laughs) Tell us about... Do you think that it... So none of us have the story about our parents being anything but straight. Um, they might have been divorced, they might have been together, they might have been accepting, they might have been not accepting, but we never actually dealt with that. But they were all straight. But they were yes. all very straight. So tell us about, was it, do you think it was easier for you to come out to your dad because he was bisexual? I think I do. Um, eventually, once I got over that hurdle mentally, mm-hmm. I realized, or at least I think I realized, the reason I didn't come out to him when he came out to me was because I was, I think I was worried that he was using it as a ploy for me to say something. Mm. So he had an idea, maybe. Yeah, and I think he was trying to out me, is what I thought at the time. Mm. That's Uh, actually kind of fair. That is. As a kid, and when you're 15, 16, I would have actually totally thought that, to be honest. Yeah. I would have. Yeah. So... So it wasn't until probably a good year later when he was actually dating a guy that I got to the conclusion that, okay, maybe he actually is bi. And it wasn't that I didn't believe him, but I definitely had doubts at first. Um, Is he gay married now? No. 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 (laughs) Um, I had to think about that because he's has ha- he's had many relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, in in my understanding of his dating, he's only ever dated two men. Mm-hmm. Um, he's had several wives, several girlfriends, um, and his current girlfriend that he's with, I believe he's been with her for the longest of any relationship since my mom, because um, mm-hmm. they were together for ten years. Okay. So I think that, yeah, I've definitely seen him with men. Um, Did you meet any of them? One. And it was very briefly. His name was Terry, and we met... Did he treat you nice? I'll fight Terry. It felt... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You ever go to a formal dinner at your in-law's place for Thanksgiving for the first time meeting them? 
I've never had an in law, so no. Okay, it felt Same. like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the, you get the gist, like yeah. the, the very formal energy. Like you're not actually sure what's what's good, what's bad to say, like whatever. Yeah. We had brunch. On as a, the gays do. As you as do. As the yes. gays do. And uh, we were in a very crowded Mexican restaurant, and I wasn't sure what to say. Yeah. So it was very light. How's school? How's your mom? How's, you know, your dating going? Yeah. And I had never been, I really hadn't dated anyone, like, what I would consider a date. Like, I probably, like, hung out with a girl here or there for a week or two. Yeah. But, like, never anything that I would consider dating serious. So how many relationships have you had in your history? In my opinion... Like what? Then, okay, so what I'm saying, what I'm counting is two. Yeah. Uh, like I've I've gone to movies and a, a dinner with a friend here or there, but it was never what I would consider serious enough. Serious enough to consider dating. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about the introduction of Coco. Yeah. To definitely. your parents. Yeah. Let's talk about that. How definitely. did that go over? So that's the third piece to my coming out. I said mm-hmm. I had three. This is the third piece is coming out to friends and and coworkers throughout the rest of my life. Yeah. Is what I would consider the third piece of my coming out. Um so I was so this is actually the really the interesting part is because I was uh when John and I first started dating, I was unsure of where it was going. Mm-hmm. I think the first three months were a little, a little rough waters, and it started getting better after that. Mm-hmm. I had introduced my mom to uh, Coco, John, um, mm-hmm. when we were in those first three months, and I'm sure I did a lot of venting because I was, I was in conflict as well. Like I wasn't sure. It was honestly. Uh, this was my first serious relationship that had lasted more than a month. Yeah. And so I was completely out of my wheelhouse. I didn't mm-hmm. really know what I was doing. And I met this person who treated me well for the first time in my life. Mm-hmm. And it felt, it felt uncomfortable, but also really wonderful at the same time. Yeah. And so I introduced my mom and I know there was a lot of venting from me to her about like this happened and this happened and I don't know what to do and and I think I put a negative connotation on it to my mom mm-hmm. in the first couple of months and then once John and I started getting on the same page about a lot of things and we started getting closer I had to kind of bring my mom back around to the fact that he was wonderful yeah, because y'all had been friends prior We'd been to... friends for years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, the dating aspect was completely new. Yeah. And uh, my mom has definitely grown on him, though. She yeah. She loves talking about our relationship and our plans and buying things for us. Really random, weird things <laughs> and sending them in the mail. So very like a lunchbox <laughs> that we don't Aww. use, but it's wonderful. Um, and John actually has met my dad. It was very briefly. He was only in town for a day, I think. Uh, I think he was in town for two days. And two days. We went to an all-you-can-eat buffet, and he seemed like the entire time that he was trying to impress me, which was weird. <laughs> Very weird, and with his wife at the time, or the girlfriend, girlfriend. long term. Who he's girlfriend. actually still with, yeah. Yeah, she was very nice, quiet, she was very nice. His dad was very, um, I don't know, just odd, like uncomfortable, I guess, like broken relationships with dads who are not in the picture. Mm-hmm. Like the conversation is very surface, like the weather and, you know, the traffic to get here and the food we're currently eating and. We and talked about faces. A lot of food. <laughs> yeah. Well, so and, many choices. Well, and, and actually, I do remember why it got so weird. Is like his dad had asked me what I do for a living, and so mm-hmm. I had explained it. Um, and I wasn't trying to be impressive, but I don't lie. 
when it comes to the in-laws. And so I was like, yeah, I have a master's degree and, you know, I work in my career field. And so um, that point of the conversation turned to where it felt like his dad was talking a lot about technology and, like, trying to impress me and whatever. And just, I don't know, it was weird from that point. But It, it definitely was weird. Um, my dad has been a professional cook and he eventually uh, transferred into being a professional home health care giver uh, for for very well off old ladies and um, helping them with their day-to-day things. So I think even though he had mastered many areas of his life, I think he was intimidated. Plus you were the first date of any kind I had ever brought home to my parents. That makes sense. Yeah. I think your dad still follows me on Facebook too. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But no, I, so here's the thing that's interesting about this entire story is the, because, like, Adam did the thing where he came out, you know, with a relationship, like, you know, try to get the parents on board, and I did the same thing. But what I recognized is, it's like, it's really challenging for your parents to get on board with another person while they're still discovering who their child that they raised is. Yeah. yeah. I, I've definitely seen that. Um, and actually, that was almost kind of Donna's story, too, about, you know, dating someone mm-hmm. and, you know, that met the parents and it yeah. not going super well. No, it didn't. And and you know, over time, I think parents, when you're as single as long as I am, um, oh, honey. <laughs> just want the best for you. They they want to see you in a happy, thriving relationship. And um, if you can't get someone else to do that with you, you just have to have it with yourself for a little while. Oh, so <laughs> no way around that. Well, and then recognizing, too, that even with Adam's story, like, um, because, so I, so I guess on this side of the spectrum, there was a time that Adam's mom had asked him to pick her up from Denver, which is four hours from Grand Junction. Adam's mom asked her to... Asked me. Well, asked Adam. Sorry. Adam's mom asked Adam. my my, My mom was flying into Denver and asked me to pick her up. Okay. But I was working late that day, so I couldn't get away because, like you said, it's a four-hour drive, so I couldn't yeah. make it off work in time to, like, get her anyways. So I decided to do it. Um, oh, and so I spent boy. four hours in the car with this woman, <laughs> and she told me all about me. And that was interesting. And she's like, she's like, honestly, I didn't really like you for the longest time. She's like, I thought you were manipulating my son. You were married when you met. I just thought your whole dynamic was awkward. Which, and, and we were blah, friends blah, first, blah. so like, we had to grow into it that. It was just like, she's just going off about things. And, and the, <laughs> I'm not intimidated of parents, but the thing is that I recognized is that it came from a place of love yeah. and like caring and kindness and whatever. And um, my mom, on the other hand, it just tries to be the friend of anybody that I date. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just wants to get to know them a little bit. But my sappy side of that story is my mom really did get on board. She never said the things to my ex that she says to Adam. Like, um, Adam and my mom say, I love you when they get off the phone. I don't say that to my mom. <laughs> I saw it. I came over here when you were, like, dead asleep last week. And, like, Adam was talking to your mother. And it was so cute because he was like, it was just like, he was just talking to her and it was so nice. And they were just conversating and he was like, well, I have to go. And she just kept talking and then he just like listened. And then he was like, well, I do have to. And then she kept talking. And then he finally was like, well, I, like, I, I have to, John's asleep and I have to go make sure he's awake for this thing we have. And she's like, all right, well, I love you. And then like they hung up and was like, was that Mama Coco? Yes. Oh, it was so cute. I did say bye probably six times. It was so so (laughs) cute. So, um, as we get towards the end of this episode, um, we, so this whole series, and I know we did five parts, and people are probably, actually, we've seen actually a lot of positive responses to this series that we did. We have. I think that we've had a lot of people listen in on this, because it's, people want to know about these types of stories. It's important to share these types of stories. Yeah, and all of our stories have been incredibly different. Yeah. It's, It's crazy how different people's stories are currently than like when we because we all came out at different periods of time oh yeah and like 
We're all millennials here. We yeah. are. I am the end of youngest, the millennial. I like millennial my, here. I'm 96, which people can test, but I'm like, I will be a millennial today. I talk about Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. But no, like, all of us have very different stories, and it's crazy. Like, and it's very different for people that come out now because it's just so much more accepted. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't have to go through um, as many struggles. I mean, I think people in middle America, yeah, obviously. People oh, in the South sure. and in middle America still do have a lot of the same struggles where it's like coming out to a very conservative um, family member could be dangerous for them. Right. It's um, crazy how an ocean well, can open someone's mind. Well, no, and, and we're also talking about America, which is currently the hot topic and it is very important to us especially. But around the world, like it's still illegal and in condemnable to death to be to come out as gay. So like in a lot of Middle Eastern countries, even yeah. even the struggles that we went through, are are still very minimal compared to what others go through. Yeah, and I'm glad that those struggles are leading to a better future. Eventually, we may not see the end right now, but yeah, as much it as will we, come. you're right. You're absolutely right. As much as we complain about this presidency and this administration, um, we also have to recognize that we're very privileged to be living where we live extremely yeah. privileged to be living where we live where we live in a democracy um, where our rights were defended and fought for yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so many people that I want to actually so part of our future episodes which we're going to be doing our true true crime yes because I actually am going to choose stories that uh, well, actually we're both choosing queer related stories yep. but specifically I want to focus on um, stories that were, are related to the unfair treatment of queer people um, you know, for just choosing to love. Yeah. I guess. So some of them will focus on the gay panic defense. Yeah. Which is something where um, I, I can't remember how many cases they've said have successfully been 60. defended. More than not. It's like either between 16 and 60. I think like just six in the number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where More that defense has, has worked. Yeah. And it's a ridiculous, that's a ridiculous defense. You shouldn't. Yes be able to kill someone because you're uncomfortable with the way that they treated you. Because you're uncomfortable with the way Not they, even the way that they treated the way you feel the, like the they way that you feel you. they treated you. Like that's you should Madness. never have permission to end someone's life because of that. You know? Agreed. And we'll go into that defense a little bit more. I do have one we have a few minutes left and I do have one question. Because it's something that I was talking about with somebody the other day. Yeah. In the time span that it's been since we've all come out as drag queens, I wanna know how like it's been coming out as a drag queen to people you're romantically interested in. Because it's been so very drastically different in the 10 years I've been doing drag, where like when I started, I would tell somebody I knew drag and I would get blocked, and now people are excited. How has it been for, for y'all in like the last like five minutes we have? Um, yeah, and I actually want to throw back a question to the class as well. Um, it's actually something I've never asked anyone before. And I, I, I'm really, because I struggle with it a lot and I talk about it a lot online. I want to know how, I mean, yes, um, if you've ever met Autumn, she's the most flaming person you've ever met in your life. How dare you? I haven't <laughs> caught fire nearly as many times as I ought to have. I want to know how, how you guys come out to coworkers and things like that. Because most of the people that I'm in this circle that I'm with right now come out so easily like adam says you there know like no my husband and blah 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 I, so for me my, my manager one day asked me she was like oh well we're having this get together do you want to bring your wife because she noticed i was wearing a wedding ring and i was like yeah i'd love to bring my husband and she did a double take and she's like oh yeah he's absolutely welcome so Aww, i had a very i had a very cool. accepting management but i also wasn't going to deal with that they were going to know right off the bat I yeah i just had an anxiety attack listening to that it's i struggle i've That's had why, so yes. many coworkers come to my drag shows because i just open with like yeah your and, mouth and <laughs> yeah like i open my mouth and first of all it's not as coke like this <laughs> <laughs> um for me it's it's been kind of mixed i've i've had coworkers um treat me like shit at my last job in in grand junction i had one lady who was very not comfortable with it um, and she would talk fuck about you, Barbara. it. <laughs> Her name was Colleen, actually. <laughs> uh, fuck you, Colleen. Colleen the Christian. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and she would talk about it when I wasn't there. Um, and it was all in the name of religion, uh, righteousness. It was uh, being pious, and um, I did my best to just not interact with her or be very personable with her. I wouldn't reveal a whole lot about my personal life with her because I didn't feel like I could. Um, so that's happened. I've had work instances where it's been very hard to be openly gay. Um, as far as coming out to guys and dating, 
uh, as a drag queen. Um, it's also been very mixed. I've had some that have been in full support and really um, had been there, but the lifestyle has been too overwhelming for them in most cases. That's how I've been a lot too. It's and, like it's too overwhelming. Yeah, and um, I've also had it to where some of them have made me feel like I should give up that part of myself in order to be dateable. And now I have the confidence to know that that's bullshit and that I'm kind of just happy being who I am. Yeah, and I'm not gonna sacrifice that piece of myself to to be marketable to people. I, I love the person that I am and I love who Donatella is and um, she'll always be around in some capacity. I don't know how much um, focus she'll take up future in my future life, but uh, that'll always be a part of my life, so. And for me, it's, um... So today, specifically as the at, as filming this, I did come out as a drag queen to the director of the place that I work today, um, because all of my coworkers know that I do drag at this point. Um, my direct supervisor still doesn't know, but my director does now. And he even said, he's like, well, I knew you did entertaining, I just didn't know you did it with drag. And, there was this moment Do you think of, you were a stripper? Like, what did he expect? I have no idea. <laughs> but there, there was this moment of uncomfortability, and it's it's so weird, because, like, certain people I work with were like, yes, in the straight yes way, and then other people were like, uh, what is that, and whatever. Just well, your more, coworkers like, have been very supportive, like, for oh, our yeah, online for show. Oh, yeah, for introvert, definitely. Like, they, they're always on there and commenting and, like, mm-hmm. being there for us. Like, your coworkers have been very supportive. Yeah, they definitely showed out, and... So, and it, this one was a little bit more odd. Um, I did, I've had moments with my coworkers where you can tell anything remotely feminine um, is uncomfortable for them. I work with now all men, um, and it's just, it, and I, I recognize that, like, they struggle with some of these aspects, but in every other area of my life, like when I do my activism or when I'm giving speeches or participating in my community is like I'm very out and open it's just the career world I'm not able to and long story short it it was a lot to do with my last job because I had a moment when I wanted to dress in drag and I was good at drag at this point um, to a work function I wanted to dress as a woman uh, as a character or something like that as a female pirate Mm -hmm. and I invited one of my new co-workers to go with me and they seemed super accepting was super on board and they wrote me the next day after I invited them and said that they would be incredibly uncomfortable and to go with me to the work function um, if I dressed in drag and they said that they pretty much just asked me if I could not go in drag pretty much. But that was also Grand Junction and like I, I try to really emphasize too like Portland even Vancouver is very different. Like yeah. I I used to ride the bus, because I used to live in Vancouver. I used to ride the bus from the sketchiest, like they call it felony flats in Vancouver, where I used to live. And when I was bad at drag, I would like drive there. So I'm really happy that you're opening up, because I feel like it's a good place for you. Yeah, I do too. And so, because I mean, all of that's still coming out of the closet. Like, you come out, like we talked about in the first episode, you come out to coworkers, family, loved ones, um, your, even your queer parents, um, in this story we learned today. Um, we never stop coming out, and sometimes it gets easier, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, there's always... Just find your good support system. There yeah. we go. Let's leave it with that. Yeah. We love a support system. Yeah. Find yeah. the people that will support you for you. Yeah. Having a safety net is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wholeness. And don't yeah. sacrifice parts of yourself to have, have love, because that's not love. That's not love <laughs> at all. Um, so. Be out. Be proud and be unapologetically you. Yeah. Happy coming out day, everybody. Happy coming out day. Yes, October 11th. uh, Share your stories if you want to. And um, just be be, safe. Be safe, yeah, be safe. And on on our website for this episode, we are going to promote people sharing their own coming out stories for those of you who are already out. Yeah. um, On our... On our website at what's our website, Donna? Our website is www.thecdsdrag.com slash I don't know the secret podcast. <gasps> uh, n- <laughs> yes, I mean, yes, That's you can all. get there from there, but yes. you can also get there from www.ajamothesecretpodcast.com. Yeah, yeah. 
It's at the. It's in our outro. You'll, yes. It'll, it'll it be the air. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I, goodness. I think there's one final point that needs to be said. Uh, as much as uh, you should come out, you should come out when you're ready. And if you don't feel safe, don't feel pressured at all whatsoever. There are many services that can help you. Look them up. Yes. Especially Find your space. if you're a youth in Portland. There are yes. so many places. Yes. Find the services. Yeah. Find places that make you feel comfortable. Poco, have you enjoyed... And Donna, have you enjoyed this segment? I have. Okay. Yeah, it's been nice. It's been illuminating. Thank you. That has. Thank you all for sharing your stories, everyone who was a part of it. Um, Touche is not here for this one, but thanks to Touche. Her. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Toodles. This has been another episode of HM of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>